morning. Welcome this morning to, to Hope First Baptist Church as, as we celebrate. Uh, we honor our heritage on the square, and we come today to worship our Lord and Savior here in this room. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online today. Uh, just go over a, a few announcements. We're, we're still collecting items for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, still collecting items for the backpack uh, snack sacks that go home on Friday nights to the kids. Uh-oh. We need a, we need some meals brought in from dear, dear friends of ours, May and Daryl Jesse. We need them at least every other day. And I'm going to put a paper out here, and we need names put down uh, for meals to be brought in to them. Please call before you bring them in to make sure that it's okay and that they're able to eat what you're bringing in. And uh, they're not doing very well, and they need help. And our church family has been always good about doing this. So please put your name down to help make meals for them. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, where was I? Next, next Saturday morning, uh, men's breakfast at, down at Duck Creek Garden. So, men, that's at 7.30. Uh, please come join us for a, a good breakfast and, and fellowship around the table. Uh, 8 o'clock? Okay. It's been changed to 8 o'clock. Uh, so, so, come at 8 o'clock. Um, youth have a, an outing on the 13th, Sunday evening, the 13th. Church bonfire and hayride and, and fun times out of the gathering field on uh, Saturday the 19th. That starts at 5.30, so come join that. Um, oh, trunk or treats coming up on the 31st, and so please be thinking of, of ways that, uh, to come join us. Decorate your car, pass out candy, uh, and just have a wonderful time sharing God's love that evening. So will you join me in prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, dear Lord, for, for those men and women so, so many years ago that came and, and decided that this is the place that they were going to start their home. This is the place that they were going to start their church. We thank you, dear Lord, for, for their insight, for, for your wisdom, your guidance, that this little town was started and, and so many faithful people have, have contributed for so many years. May we continue that faithfulness to, to you, uh, the faithfulness to the community, dear Lord, the faithfulness to the church, and faithfulness to each other. We just thank you for, for all the blessings you just give us, dear Lord. We, dear Lord, we thank you for the rain that we have received. Dear Lord, we, we pray for um, those families, those towns, those cities that, that were devastated by the the hurricane and we just just pray that um, you would be with them that you would encourage them and give them wisdom and guidance to go forward from this place on we we pray for those families that have lost loved ones dear lord we just uh, pray your your compassion and your love be poured out upon them we thank you dear lord for for our pastor and for his family we just ask your continued blessing and, and protection over them. Uh, we thank you, dear Lord, for, uh, for answered prayers. We thank you for results of tests, dear Lord, and, and we just thank you for the miracles that we have seen. We pray for those that are um, waiting for answers to test. We're, we're waiting for uh, results of of exams, dear Lord, we just pray that your hand be involved in that, uh, that whatever situation that is going on, dear Lord, you are in control. We pray for, for Daryl and May as, as they struggle, dear Lord. We pray for uh, Jim Baker and, and Dean Young and, and Tom Hall. And dear Lord, we pray for uh, Anita Beaker this morning. We just pray that you would ease the pain in her arm, that uh, she would feel some comfort, dear Lord, that the healing uh, be quick and complete. 
Dear Lord, now as, as we continue on with, with our worship service, joining the, the hosts that are around you, may you be glorified, may you be honored. We pray all of this in your son's precious name. Amen. Reading from the 45th chapter of Isaiah, beginning in verse 4. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you don't know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. The Lord, I have created it. You stand with us this morning and join us as we sing.
healer, awesome and power. Bless you, bless you. Turn around somebody and go, bless you. Bless you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now turn to somebody else and really mean it this time. Bless you. Bless them up in Jesus' name. In G just right in the face. Bless you in Jesus' name. Good. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to preach till my throat gives out, so you pray. Somebody will go, I'm not praying. I'm just waiting for it to give out. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, I want to, maybe I'll get a, a hoodie, tennis shoes, sweatpants. Over the next week, I want to coach us. I'm going to take on a coach role. And here's what I want to coach you in, is sharing testimonies of the goodness of God. Okay? And... Um, I think that in this room, God has already done enough. In this room right here, God has already done enough that if the story got out, it would change the community we live in. Let me make that provocative statement again. I think already in this room, the Lord has done enough that if the story got out, it would change the community we live in. Here's what I really, really believe. Every problem that people are going through in our community, God has already solved that problem in this room. I don't think that anybody in our community is going through anything that somebody in this room has not already been through that. The problem is the disconnect between what God has done and other people hearing about it. Does that make some manner of sense? And so what I want to do over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about 
the power of the testimony, the most versatile and powerful tool in your Christian uh, tool belt is your own testimony, okay? And let me tell you a couple things your testimony will do. Number one is it will create worship. It will create worship in you. If you will revisit what God has done for you in the past, it will create worship in your own heart that you didn't have before you thought about it, okay? So it will create worship. Number two is it will sow hope because God does not love one person more than another. The Bible says he is no respecter of persons, okay? So if God has done something for me, guess what? Uh, Sarah, raise your hand up. Just, ra just raise your other one too. Now last Sunday, she could not do that. Came down, got prayed for. Now, and, and Sarah's a hard-headed testimonier, and she'll just do that all service just to prove to you. Know? Now, <laughs> yeah, I can do it again and again and again. Okay, now, I'm not faking or playing something. She could not do that last Sunday. She came down, she got prayed for. When she walked out, she could do it. Okay, how many people know that God loves Sarah more than anybody in this room? Many people think that's a false statement, that God loves Sarah more than anybody else in this room. Okay, I love to argue that one because God's not linear. Only a linear person can love one thing more than another person. But the reality is God can pour out all the love in God on Sarah and simultaneously pour out all the love of God on you. So that's a philosophical question that's amazing because I personally think I'm God's favorite. The rest of you just put up with it. And that's absolutely true, but you're God's favorite too because God's nonlinear. Okay? But here's the point I want to make. Does God love Sarah more? No. But if God will touch Sarah, what does that do in my heart? It sows a hope that God can God could touch me too. And B, if I talk about it long enough and keep narrowing it down, pretty soon you'll go, hey, wait a minute, God can touch me. So not only is it so hope, it, it creates faith. Your testimony will create faith in somebody else. Okay? And then number four, and this is one of the main things I'm going to talk about today, <laughs> a testimony is a down payment on it happening again. And I might tell you a couple of testimonies about that. But a testimony creates an opportunity for it to happen again. How many people in this room are saved? How did you get saved? What did you do? Tell, tell me what happened. You believed in Christ. Why did you believe in Christ, Daryl? Why did you believe in Christ? How did you hear about that? How did you hear? He did it 2,000 years ago. How did you hear about that story? You heard uh, the story of Jesus at a revival meeting because somebody else shared that they had been born again. Had your mom been born again? Yeah. And was she praying for you? Yeah. yeah. And did you... Did you mom, grandma, dad, grandma... Grandpa, dad, I'll translate because Daryl and I are from the south, and all of them, and all of them means everybody else that was a Christian. Okay, now watch. People say Daryl got saved by the word. That's absolutely true. But let me tell you what Daryl got saved by, a testimony. Because there was somebody that believed the word that told him he could see in real time what it looked like to believe the word there is no one in this room that is not saved because of somebody else. And what happened was there's a testimony that traveled from a testimony to a testimony. Anybody in the room ever been healed? Sarah, would you raise your hand, please? Okay, yeah, yeah, she's excited today, man. I couldn't do this, now I can do this. Y'all just put up with it, okay? Uh, thanks, Sarah, I won't make you do it all day, but. Let me ask you again. I don't know. Okay. Sarah got healed. 
What's her testimony? Help me out. What's her testimony? Just say, I got healed. What's her testimony? I got healed. What's Daryl's testimony? I got saved. Anybody in the room ever been under an addiction or a power that you could not get out of? You came to Christ and you got out of the addiction or the power. Is there anybody in the room like that? Don't be ashamed of it. Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let me pick on somebody. <laughs> I'll pick on Darren. Okay. If, if I were to ask Darren, what's your testimony? Darren would say, I got free. Right. And I said, Darren, how did you get free? And I have done this privately. How did you get free? And he goes, I believed in Jesus. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So Sarah got healed. Daryl got saved. Darren got free. I'm going to show you an aspect of something. You need to understand this. Now, I'm going to be smart, Alec. Put up with smart, Alec, for a minute. Okay? Because here's the story. That story is not Sarah's story. It is not Daryl's story. And it is not Darren's story. That story is Jesus' story. Because Sarah, here's what Daryl would say. And just go ahead. And I'm not going to be mean, but I, I want to unwrap something. Daryl asked Jesus into his life. How many people have asked Jesus into their life? <laughs> okay. Stay with me. Daryl did not ask Jesus into his life. Jesus invited Daryl into his life. The story is not Sarah got healed. The story is Jesus healed somebody. The story is not Darren got free. The story is Jesus set somebody free. And that there are two, and I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. There are two dimensions to every testimony, please hear me, that make it one testimony. Because the testimony is not her testimony. Though she got saved, you were in your early 20s, right? <laughs> early 40s, early 40s. Um, 20s encounter that was leading toward in her early 40s is when she actually said a prayer. And listen to this, what happened? Here's the way we'll say it. And Christ came into her life. Okay? That's not the real story. At 40, she opened her heart and Christ invited her into his life. Now, let me tell you what a testimony is. A testimony is Christ wrote you into his story. The way we tell it is, here's chapter one of my book, here's chapter two of my book, here's chapter three of my book. In chapter four, I wrote Christ into my story. Chapter five is my post story with Christ, okay? <clears throat> we see that from a human perspective. The reality is Christ wrote me into his story at that time, okay? So therefore, I'll show you in the Bible. There is only one testimony in the earth. Whose testimony is it? Come on, say it real loud. It's Jesus' testimony. Every human being that has encounter with that testimony that are telling their story, they are simply telling a branch off of the tree of the story of Christ. Right? So now can I be smart, Ellie, just a minute? Don't keep it to yourself. It's not your story. It is illegal for God to do something for me and me not tell about it. Totally illegal. Okay? How about if you're shy? What if you are shy? <laughs> so what I want to do is unwrap over the next couple of weeks. Here's the way to tell that story, sometimes subtly, 
sometimes very dramatically. But how do I tell the story? Because every time I tell the story, it sows worship, it sows hope, it sows faith, and it sows an opportunity for it to happen again. Okay? I'm going to give you another small outline. Oh, and wrap it over the time. Therefore, your greatest tool, tool in your tool belt is the story of what Christ has done in me, through me, to me. Okay? Sometimes that can be apologetic. People are saying, I believe this, you believe that, you're wrong, I'm wrong, and you go, okay, okay, I don't know about all the arguments, I haven't done all science, you're smarter than me, but let me tell you a story. Once I was blind, now I can see, right? Once I lived on the streets, now I own a business. Go ahead and, I don't know what your argument is, I know I once was blind, now I can see. An educated blind man brought before what would have been the Supreme Court of their day. They are questioning him, arguing with him, and he goes, wait a minute, guys, I ain't even been to school. That's in the Greek in between. <laughs> right? I don't even know what y'all talking about. They go, do you, do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? I go, A, he goes, A, I don't know what a Messiah is, and B, I've never seen him. Because here's what I want you to think about. Until that guy said that, I never thought about it. The blind man never saw Jesus. He comes up to Jesus blind. Jesus puts, uh, makes a, a paste, puts it on his eyes. He goes, dips in the pool of shalom. He comes back seeing. When did he start seeing? At shalom. Had he ever seen Jesus? No. They go, do you think that he is? A, he goes, dude, I've never even seen him before. But I know this. I once was blind, now I see. And then he got personal and they kicked him out. He goes, and I've been coming to your church for 35 years, ain't none of you could help me at all. Which one do you think I'm believing? <laughs> and they said, shut up and get out of here. And he did. And then he runs into Jesus on the street. And Jesus goes, do you believe in me? And dude goes, I don't even know who you are. Oh, I'm the guy that healed you. Yeah, I believe in you. Right? Now watch. Under great argument, and please hear me, it doesn't matter if people are smarter than you. It doesn't matter if they have a better argument. You have your encounter with God. Your encounter with God is greater than any argument any human being could ever have. I was in California uh, when I was in college. I was working among Korean people. And there was a lady that went to the doctor. She knew one English word. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hello, goodbye, thank you, John 3.16. That's all the English that she knew. She went to the doctor. She goes to the doctor. It's a long, very intricate story. It's one of the great stories of the church that I was at. The doctor is asking her a question. She quotes the scripture. Ask her another question. Quotes the scripture. I don't believe in all that stuff you're trying to give me. She goes, I don't know English. She quotes John 3, 16, seven times. And on the seventh time, the doctor began to cry. Received Christ as his savior. They found out later as, as they're asking questions about that, they found out later that the doctor actually had had grown up in a Christian home, had uh, in college turned away from the Lord, had become an atheist, and now a little Korean lady is sitting in his uh, uh, office quoting a scripture that his mother used to quote to him that touched him emotionally and he turns away from his atheism and turns back to the Lord. Uh, watch. He was smarter. He knew a language. He had a better argument, but he did not have a better encounter with God. Right? So now her testimony becomes her apologetic argument is I know God that has changed my life. Does that, does that make some manner of sense? 
<laughs> so there are times that your testimony, it becomes an apologetic ar argument. Other times it becomes a ministry. If I've been through something or I know somebody has been through something, I find somebody else is going through that. Now let me tell you about this thing about it being Jesus' testimony, not mine. <laughs> if I find somebody that can't raise their arms and I go to them, oh, I know this lady, she came to our church, we prayed for her for a few minutes, and her, she raised her arms up. Sarah's testimony is my testimony because it's Christ's testimony and the only testimony I have is Christ. Right? So now I'm, I share her testimony with faith because it's not Sarah's. Sarah is not smart enough to heal herself. And there ain't nobody up here that prayed for her good enough to do it because it was Jude. And we know he ain't that good. <laughs> but when Jude lays his hands on her and he goes in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth... All of a sudden, Jude has plugged into the true testimony, and that true testimony is Christ. Now, I'm, I can legitimately tell her story to somebody else. It will give them encouragement, right? Somebody will go, oh, I'm so depressed. I'm going through surgery. I'm not getting better. I go, oh, they're just a lady in our church. She's been through 30 surgeries. She came through all of them. God helped her through some. Doctors helped her through others. Here she is right now. She always has this bright, shining countenance. I asked her about it. And she said it's because of the God she believes in. You're going through a tough time. I get it. Could we just pray that the God that helps my friend, that that God would help you right now? And now, all of a sudden, Brenda's testimony is my testimony because it's Christ's testimony. Does that make some manner of sense to us? <clears throat> so my testimony, A, becomes an apologetic. B, it becomes a ministry tool. C, it becomes a witnessing tool. People give me seven reasons why Jesus is not God. And I will say, I was on a pole 165 feet over top the city of Chicago uh, doing line work. I had an encounter with God. It was 40 years ago. Uh, it changed me, and I have never changed back. My whole world became different when I met God on that pole. How would you like to meet a God that's bigger than the argument in your head? How would you like for your heart to take you where your head will never fit and meet the God that changed me forever? That within two hours of coming down off that pole, every man that was on the crew I was working on came up and asked me, what in the world is different about you? How would you like to meet a God like that? And now all of a sudden it becomes a witnessing tool. So it's your greatest, but here's what I'm going to say. It's the greatest underutilized worship potential. You understand what I'm saying? When we don't share it, God doesn't get the glory that he would get if we just simply share the testimony. And a lot of times it's like we don't know how to do it. So in the next couple of weeks, I just want to help us go, here's how to tell your story. I can tell my story in three hours or I tell it in three seconds, right? And in, a, in, in your testimony, there's an anatomy of it. And we're going to learn this from the Apostle Paul. He tells his testimony three times in the book of Acts. And here's the anatomy of it testimony. I'll unlock this later. I'm not going to preach it today. There's the pre-Jesus encounter. There's the Jesus encounter. And there's the post-Jesus encounter. Okay. So before I met Jesus, I was one way. Here's how I met Jesus. After I met Jesus, here's how things are different. And that goes from my salvation testimony to everything the Lord has ever done for me. Before Christ intervened, here's what it was like. Here's how Christ intervened. Here's what, how it's been different since he intervened. And I'll help us, a little format that's always in my mind. I'm looking for opportunity to, sh an opportunity will arise and sometimes I create an opportunity to just go, here's what it was like before Jesus. Here's how Jesus encountered. Here's how it's been different. <laughs> so what we're gonna see the apostle Paul do, according to the group, he adapts his story. One time he'll go, oh, it's really important that you know what it was like before I met Christ. 
here's how I met Christ, here's how it's different. Another time he'll go, uh, it's important for you to know how I met Christ, here's what it was like before, and then he spends the whole body of the testimony telling you how he met Christ. Then he'll go, and now here's how it's been different. Then another time he goes, here's what it was like before Christ, here's what, how I met him, and here's how it has totally been different. How would you like your life to be different like mine? Right? And so I'll, I'll help us unwrap that. <laughs> but today I want to go a little bit philosophical. Uh, I kind of laid the foundation of the three things that we're going to do over the time. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to have you go with me to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to go to verse 10. I'm going to show you the eternal mention of a testimony. And here's what I mean by that. <coughs> um, is that if Sarah got healed, Jesus is the healer. And so what we see is Sarah's testimony is actually Jesus' t testimony. Daryl got saved. He invited Jesus into his life, but actually it was an invitation of Christ inviting Daryl into his life. Does that make sense? And so we will see it from the earth perspective. Heaven sees it from the heaven perspective. Therefore, and here's the whole reason I say that is to make a, here's a very important statement. We always keep Jesus as the center of the testimony. When I tell my testimony, my objective is not to have me as the center of the testimony. It's to have Christ as the center of the testimony. Does that make sense? If I pray for somebody, somebody is healed or they get provision, my goal is not, oh, I prayed for them. Because people will gravitate to that. You remember Paul uh, and uh, uh, who was it? Uh, James and John or uh, Peter. Peter and who? Uh, go up to the temple. Peter and James, go up to temple guy gets healed they're going we're gonna make you guys you guys are the kings and all like that and they go why are you looking at us it wasn't what we did it was the name of jesus this guy's made whole you get you guys remember that <laughs> right and so we always have jesus at the center of every testimony because christ is the testimony it's actually his testimony so i i want to tell when i tell testimony especially if i want ministry at the end because people can look around and tell that I'm not a big shot, it's gonna be able to help them. But if I tell the story in such a way, Jesus is the big shot, then they can go, well, I can have faith that he might be able to help me. And so when we're moving it toward ministry, always remember, keep Jesus at the center of the testimony. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I'm gonna take us to a scripture and uh, it's in Revelation chapter 19. Give you a backstory, three minutes. John is in church on Sunday morning. Nobody else is there, but he has church anyway. Uh, it must have been Heritage Days. Everybody else was over at Heritage Days. It might have been raining there right at home. I don't know what the deal was. But John goes, it was the Lord's Day, so I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. <laughs> he's on an island all by himself. But still, when it's the Lord's Day, he sets his heart toward the Lord. This is Revelation 1. Sets his heart toward the Lord. Three different times he has caught up into heaven and the Lord shows him things will, that will pass, come to pass on the earth and things that will happen in the eternal realm. The third time he's caught up is Revelation 19. And uh, just to keep it interesting, John on that day actually saw your face. Because what he sees is the end of the age and the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the marriage supper of the Lamb is all believers from all ages and generations that are gathered around the Lord. And he sees the symbolism of the Lord marrying the church and a great audience. And the great audience is the church and the one being married is the church. But here's what I want you to know. If you are born again, you will be there on that day. And John saw that day. He saw the day you will actually live in. Can you imagine that? You go, they're trying to kill me and Jesus is giving me something to say. They've put me out here all by myself and now I'm gathered up with thousands times ten thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands and a multitude that nobody can uh, uh, number that is bowed before the Lamb of God forever. 
And so every time, this is a very interesting, just a side note, every time John is caught up, he sees around the throne, he sees the marriage of the Lamb. Every time John is caught up, I could literally say this with confidence, he saw your face in a great, massive crowd, right? So he has this in 19, he has this escort angel that's showing him some amazing things, okay? And now let me unwrap three little hidden gems in this passage. <laughs> when he sees the marriage supper of the lamb, it undoes him and falls down at the feet of this escort angel. All right. And I put his feet to worship him, but he said, see that you do not worship me. If you ever have anybody that says they saw an angel and they down and worship the angel and the angel received the worship. Go ahead, go ahead, Luke. It's, it's not real, is it? There's only one created being that tried to steal worship that belongs to God. What was his name? Satan. And he talks what? How many of the angels of heaven go with him? A third of the angels of heaven, he talks them out of heaven and they follow with him. Now watch this. Any angelic being that will receive worship is not from God. This angelic being is one of, the, one of the main messenger angels of heaven. John falls down to worship him and he goes what? Do not worship me. What happened to that angel if he would receive the worship? Well, it would be an instant fall. He's fallen into the same trap as Satan himself. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm saying this on, por on purpose. It is very important because we're going to unlock a little passage in the scripture. Watch this. Do not do that. I am your what? Fellow servant. Watch this. The angel says, I am, listen to this. I am your servant who is a fellow the angel that's been escorting john around there are angels that put one foot on one continent in the book of revelation another foot on another continent somebody say big you're right this angel greater than that angel is escorting john around showing him things to come watch it john falls down to worship him and he goes get up I am your servant. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Watch this. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Now watch what the angel says. I am a servant of the testimony of Jesus. You are a servant of the testimony of Jesus. Now let's unpack what the angel says. The angel says, I do not have the testimony of Jesus. You and your brethren have the testimony of Jesus. I am a servant of the testimony of Jesus. The only thing I do and everything I do is for the testimony of Jesus that you and your brethren have, but I don't have it. You see that in the scripture? Let me unpack it further. There's no such thing as a saved angel. First Peter says angels desire to look into salvation and cannot comprehend it. Let me unpack that for you. They are bigger, stronger, smarter, faster, sing better. I heard a uh, pastor say one time, groups trying to get in there, they can't get a song right. And uh, they go, we're not going to sing it. And he goes, I really want you to sing the song. No, we don't have it perfect. And, and here's what he said. He goes, I think compared to the angels, it really didn't matter that much. I think that the worship that God's getting on perfect pitch from 10,000 times 10,000 and the brightness coming out of it. And if you hit C or C sharp, I think they can't really tell the difference. And so. Our goal today is to worship God with, the, with this song because it's important to us and we 
appreciate your excellence, but your excellence is nothing compared to that excellence. Does that make sense? How many of you will think that might be right? But do you know there has never been in the history of eternity an angel that sinned against God that is not cast into the lake forever? Have a question. Has anybody in this room ever sinned against God? Where do you intend to spend eternity? And the angels in 1 Peter and this angel here, guys, you go ahead and explain that to me. How could these perfect beings make an imperfect act and cast them out forever? And you are imperfect. And you invite Jesus into your heart and he forgives you of all your sins, washes them away as if they did not exist and redeems you to live with him forever. How many people think that that's very hard to understand? So do the angels. Look at this. They peer into it and they go, what in the world is this thing we don't understand called the testimony of Jesus? Guys, when you come to an altar like Daryl did, and you say, Jesus, I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. The price for that to happen 2,000 years later was 2,000 years earlier. Heaven bankrupted itself, took its prime personality, gave it to the earth. He became a man, died on a cross, resurrected it ascended on high and now he has a testimony I have died I have resurrected I have ascended come on Brenda and because of what I've done I forgive Brenda my blood washes away every sin and now she enters the testimony of Jesus <laughs> And because she has entered the testimony of Jesus every angel in heaven says we will work with and for Brenda because she's amazing. It's true. What made her amazing? Come on. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. There is no being in heaven that has a greater testimony than Brenda. I sat with a bunch of, I've told this story a hundred times, I'll tell it a hundred more. A bunch of girls and boys and young people who've been affected by drugs. Some of those young girls had done anything possible to get drugs. And in it's a little Christian girl. And the little Christian girl says, I don't have a testimony. God's never saved me from what he saved you from. And one of those smart little street smart girls says, he saved you from it. He saved us out of it. It's still all about him. And what she was saying is, there is no greater testimony in this circle right here than the testimony of Christ. Because if there is a saved, it just says there's a savior. See, my faith is not strong enough for the problem that I face. But thank God, it's not based on my faith. It's based on a deliverer who can deliver me. When I get delivered, I raise my hands and I go, I've been delivered. And he goes, yeah, because I'm a good deliverer. <laughs> now, here are the angels looking from the eternal perspective. And they go, the testimony that you carry is not simply your testimony. It is the testimony of Christ. Brethren, for the testimony of Christ. And then right in the middle, John just falls down, starts worshiping him. Now, if you're in heaven and you're seeing something that's at least 2,000 years from where he is, <laughs> I don't know what you would think would be the most important thing at that moment. But he's overwhelmed by what he sees. Maybe he sees his own, his own side. He goes, I made it. There's some of my friends. This is the end of the age. Yay, we won. The victory is Jesus forever. <laughs> and right in the middle of it, Tom, the angel goes, <laughs> the most important thing in this scenario 
is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then he goes, and I'll finish in the next 20, half hour. No, in fact, next five, five, 10 minutes, right? He goes, the most important thing in this scenario is the testimony of Jesus. And then he goes this, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, I have that memorized one day. It's, I'm just thinking, meditating. That scripture pops out in my mind. I think about it in context, and I go, okay, spirit of prophecy is testimony of Jesus. John caught up this prophetic encounter. The testimony of Jesus is important, is the most important thing in all prophetic encounters. Yes, that's true. But then my mind falls on this thing that I know. And the thing that I know is the word testimony in the Hebrew language. Let me tell you what testimony means in the Hebrew language. In the Hebrew language, if you give testimony, A, it means you're a witness. Do I have any witness for Jesus Christ? And here's the second part, and this is very interesting. What a witness says goes on record. So there's a little lady, she types real fast, she got a special keyboard. Everything said, I've been in depositions, I've been in court before. Everything that said, the court recorder is typing. Stay with me just a minute. So whenever I stand up and gave my testimony in a court of law, the recorder is recording it. That is called a testimony. And this is called a testimony. The witness and the record. This can't be Sarah, raise your hand one more time. I'm using you as an illustration. We're just glad she can raise her hand. Go ahead and stand up. Come on. Four months ago, she couldn't do that, right? Uh, Sarah down here, we pray for her for a long time. Brenda was there praying for her. And uh, finally, Sarah, after 20 minutes, you remember that? She goes, I can't do this. <laughs> you can't do what? She goes, I can't stand for 20 minutes. I can only stand about two minutes, 10 minutes. I got to sit down. I've been standing here for 20 minutes. I can't do this. I don't need that walker anymore. And so she walked out to her car without her walker. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Now let me tell you the amazing of that. She's the witness, but when she gave record, stood up and told that testimony, it has to be public for it to be a record. When she gave record of that, Nobody, anywhere, anytime can take away that record. Come on. Anybody remember the song, uh, a new name written down in glory? And it's mine, Lord, it's mine. I can't sing regular, so don't try to get me to sing country. Okay. <laughs> Watch. The witness is, I got saved. The record is, my name was written in heaven. The reality is that record cannot be altered. So watch what happens. Jesus does something, I give witness. When I give witness, it goes on record. Eternally, he gets worship for it. Huh? I tell Dan, three years later, Dan tells my story, it goes on record again. And it goes on record again and it goes on record again, and it goes on record again. Who is being testified to? It's not Dennis. Who's being testified to is Christ, and it's going on record that he's right. Here's the third thing. The third thing in Hebrew, this is amazing. It comes from a word that means because it went on record, it was duplicated, okay? And it is... You remember how to say that word. No, it's, it's A-Y-O-O-D. It's Hebrew word. Some people do it E-H-U-D. Ahud. And here's what it means. It possesses within it the ability to do it again. It, what are they saying? You gave testimony in court. It went on record. Now, anytime we come to court again, 
this record has the same ability as if you were giving witness. Does that make sense? To the Hebrew mind, that makes totally sense. But here's what it's saying about a testimony. When Sarah gives her testimony, Jesus healed me, it creates the environment for Jesus to do it again. Now for her, it was a shoulder, but sometimes he might just slip out of the box and heal a back when you give a testimony for a shoulder. The testimony is simply creating the environment for God to do it again. That's all the New Testament, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is you proclaim what's about to happen. <laughs> when someone gives a testimony, they are proclaiming what's about to happen again. Does that make sense? Anybody have a real good testimony? Anybody, has Jesus just been good enough to anybody in this room that you can remember him being good to you? <clears throat> Do you know anybody that needs the story that you have? This morning, I, I, let me give you three stories and an amen. Uh, this morning, I was uh, sitting out on my porch, and I'm just rehearsing the power that's in a testimony. And I thought about this time. It was just amazing. It's not amazing when you're going through it. It's amazing when it's over. Uh, uh, <laughs> I had made some decisions. I felt like the Lord told me to do. And I go into a ministry. And just, things didn't turn out like I thought they were going to. But <clears throat> anyway, I was without a job. And uh, I'd done some work through Temp Agency. Temp Agency didn't have any work. I get a letter on Wednesday that they are, if I don't pay electric bill by Friday, they're shutting the electric off on Monday. So on Wednesday, I get a bill. Yeah, it's $100. This was uh, 400 years ago, so it was worth a little bit more money. But uh, it's $100. It has to be paid Friday. I get it on Wednesday, so now Thursday. It's Thursday. It has to be paid Friday or Monday, my electric's being shut off. And... Uh, this is one of the most dramatic times and stories of my life. I, I sit down on the couch. Anybody ever had a problem so big that it'll take you from the couch to your knees? And uh, I, I'm kneeling at my couch praying. And uh, in the old days, when they built houses, they built a flap in them that you put mail through. And I'm, I'm kneeling, praying. I need $100. God, you see this. Where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Uh, that's the whiny part at the beginning of the prayer. God, would you please help? Whatever my prayer was. And I hear my flap go slap. You can hear it when the mail comes through. Now, it wasn't mail time, but I hear a slap. Go look. When I bend down, there's an envelope. When I come back up, I see a lady running down the street that I know. But there's no way she would know my problem. I open up the envelope, in it is a note. And the note goes, I was praying for you this morning. God told me this was urgent. Must have because she's running. God told me this was urgent. And inside the note was a $100 bill. While I'm praying, $100 drops through the door less than 10 feet away. That's exactly what I need. That'd be a good story. It gets better. I've always felt important that tithing was important. And I go, well, I got to give $10 of this back to God. Uh, that leaves me with 90. But if I give them 90, you know, in my mind, I'm running through it. <coughs> if I give them 90, they'll probably hold the electricity so I can get the other 10. Next week, I'll get 10 for it. It's all going to work out. Thank you, Jesus. Walk five blocks from my house. There's a ministry I know about that works behind the iron curtain and bamboo curtain at that time. I go in and I go, I knew this is embarrassing, but it's just got to work this way. I have $100. I want to give it to you, but I want you to give me 90 back. <laughs> I want to tithe, but I want to tithe all this 100. Would you give me? And he goes, yeah, I can break it. I kind of knew the guy. And uh, we're talking and he goes, didn't you live on Mr. Phil for a while? Yeah. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. He goes, he goes, we had a guy 
that goes around to churches and does demonstrations for us. He quit yesterday. Would you mind to do that for us? Now all of a sudden I have a job. And then he goes, every time somebody goes out, we give them X amount of money. We give them $25. And then uh, some other compensation also. He goes, next Wednesday, we need somebody to go out. Could you do that? I go, well, of course I could do that. And he goes, well, here's your pre-$25. I left my house with $100. Not enough money to pay the bill. I came back with $115. Having already paid the top. I'm like, this is just like amazing. I, I told that story in my church. After service, and, and here's why I said it. I don't know what your problem is or what your provision need is. Here's what I know. There's a testimony greater than the story being told you by this earth. And that Jesus can provide even if it's the last minute. And then we invited people up that have vision needs. Pray for them. After service, one of my leaders, she's crying. She's, she is not, she is crying. Tears are streaming off her face. She comes up, gets a hold of herself. What's going on? And she goes, that story you told is exactly my story. I said, well, what are you talking about? She goes, I needed X amount of money. I was bowing at my couch, talking to the Lord. My doorbell rang. She goes, I go to my doorbell. When I went to my doorbell, remember the, uh, they used to have the mailbox hanging on the side, of the, and you'd take a, uh, a clothespin, and if you had a letter, you'd put the clothespin on the letter. Anybody remember that? Anybody that old? Yeah. She goes, I'm praying. My doorbell rings. I go to my door. They're hanging is an envelope with my name on it. She goes, I take the envelope, I open it up, and it's exactly the amount of money that I was praying for on my couch. And I go, hey, guess what? Your testimony, my testimony, are the same testimony because of the testimony of Christ. When he provides, saves, delivers, heals, it's amazing to us because it touches our lives. The real perspective is there's a God in the heavens over all that is watching over us and giving the testimony that will affect others always. Also, isn't that cool? So I just want you to see that perspective. Two things about it. A, all testimonies are the testimony of Christ. There's one testimony in the earth. We've been grafted into it. And then B is when we give the testimony, it sets up an opportunity for the blessing, grace, goodness of God to actually be shared with other people also. We got those two points. Successful day from the coach. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to invite our worship team to come. <laughs> if you have a need, we'll be down here. We'll pray for you. Let me pray for you. Lord, you've done such amazing things. I like to just tell stories and talk about it because it reminds us of your goodness over our lives individually. I, I pray the stirring up this morning of your goodness in the heart of people in this room. I pray you just remind us of time after time after time that your goodness has been sufficient in our lives. We thank you for the stories of your healing and your salvation and your deliverance and your provision. We ask that in these days, the days ahead, that they would be duplicated as we simply share the goodness you've been toward us. That I pray for those in this room in the midst of challenge and in the midst of struggle. May the testimonies in the days ahead release uh, strength and faith and hope to them. Father, I pray for those that do not know you. May the supernatural nature of your goodness be kindness that leads them towards your very presence and your salvation. We come to worship you and give you the glory, do your name. We come to stand before you in your own excellence.
to say great is our God and to worship you because of your goodness toward us. As we do that, we ask that you would interact with us, that your presence would be strong and near. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, dear Lord, for your testimony in our lives. As we go into your world this week, may we live that testimony that others may see it in us. Go with us. Keep us safe within your arms. Make us bold, dear Lord, living for you. We pray all of this that you would be glorified. Amen. Woo!